Canto 16. I had come to a place where murmurings of water, tumbling down to the next round, made a humming sound like bees round a hive. When starting out together, three shades ran straight towards us, leaving another group to the torment of the bitter downpour. They came towards us, each crying aloud. Stop! Please stop from your clothes! You seem to be from our wicked city of Florentine! Ah, oh, what wounds there I saw upon their limbs! Recent scars and old brands seared by the flames. I still feel a pang when I think of them. My teacher heard their shouting and turning said to me, Wait, these shades you should respect, were it not for the fire that falls here, by the nature of the place I should say that you, not they, should do the hurrying. Then as we paused, they resumed their wailing, and on nearing us formed a single wheel, reaching out like ancient wrestlers, oiled, stripped, alert to possible advantages or holds, before risking a throw or swapping blows. And as they wheeled round, each twisted his face to look at me, so that their necks and feet travelled in constant opposition. If the misery of these shifting sands, began one, and our charred and scorched features make you despise us and our petition, then let our great earthly fame induce you to tell us who you are and how you walk with still living feet and such assurance. He whose footsteps you see me following, although now he goes naked and peeled bare, was of a higher rank than you might think. He was grandson of the good Gualdrada. His name was Guido Guerra. In his life his intellect was as potent as his sword. The other, treading the sand next to me, is Tegiayo Elderbrandi, whose wise voice deserved more welcome in the world above. And I... Stuck with them in torment here, I was Jacopo Rusticucci. Truly, more than anything, my downfall was my wife. Had I been protected from the fire, I should have leapt into their midst then, and think my teacher would have suffered it. But since I would have burnt and baked myself, fear overcame goodwill, which made me long to enfold them in my arms. I began... It was sorrow, not contempt. I felt in my soul for your condition, so profound it will not leave me quickly. The moment my lord addressed me in words through which I gathered men like you might come. I am of your land, and since I was young I have spoken of your great deeds, and heard of your honourable names with much pride. I leave the Gaul behind, bound for sweet fruit that I was promised by my truthful guide. But first I must descend to the centre. May your soul remain to lead your body, and may your fame multiply after you, he replied to me. If you can tell us if courtesy and valour linger still within our city as they used to do, or have they been banished altogether? For Guglielmo Bossieri, who lately joined our band of sufferers, provokes us greatly by that which he relates. Upstarts and their sudden riches, I cried, chin raised, have bred excess and arrogance in that city of Florence, for which you weep already. They took this as my answer, exchanging glances as men do when they hear the truth. If at some other time, all three replied, you make others content so readily, then happy you, whose words come with such ease. If you manage to leave these murky realms and return to see the lovely stars again, when you repeat with pleasure... There I was. Speak of us to the people living there. They broke their wheel then and ran off. Swift legs seemed wings for flight. You could not say amen before they disappeared out of sight. And now my master thought it time to go. I followed him. And we had not gone far when falling water thundered close by us so we hardly heard each other speaking. I had a rope bound round my waist which I thought at one time I might use to snare the leopard with a brightly spotted skin. Unwinding this completely from my waist, according to my master's instructions, I passed it to him, gathered up in coils. He took it, 
and then turning to the right, cast it from the edge into the abyss. He spoke. Soon, what I expect will rise up, and what your fancy dreams of shall be seen. Though tempted, a man should close his lips upon a truth which seems more like a lie, for then, innocent of blame, he'll have to take it. I shall not keep silence, or my reader. I swear by the verses of my comedy, so they may receive enduring favour, that through the thick and murky air I saw a figure come swimming up, startling to the strongest heart, like one returning who has dived down to set free an anchor, caught on some rocky ledge or snagged on weed, arms stretched upwards, feet drawn in and kicking. Canto 17 Look! The monster with its sharpened tail, which passes over mountains, ramparts and defences. Look at him. The pestilence of the whole world. My guide addressed these words to me, and then beckoned to the beast to come ashore, close to where the rocky path broke away. And on he came, that effigy of fraud, landing with his head and chest on the edge, but not drawing his tail upon the bank. His were the features of an honest man, outwardly benign. The rest was all snake. He had two clawed paws, hairy to his armpits. On his back and belly and on both his sides were strange painted knots and curlicues. No Tartars or Turks ever wove a cloth, showing colours more intricately done. Nor were such webs spun on Arachne's loom. As fishing boats will sometimes lie ashore, part in the water, part on firmer ground, or in regions where drunken Germans guzzle, the beaver dips his tail to take his prey, so that most loathsome beast lay at anchor on the stony rim that borders the sand. Out in the void he twitched his tail about, tensing in a curve the poisonous fork that armed its tip just like a scorpion. My guide said, Now we must make a detour off our route to where that beast is lying. Descending, and keeping to the right hand, we took ten paces toward the abyss to avoid the hot sand and falling flame. We had reached the creature's place, when I saw, sitting on the sand a little way off, some spirits beside the yawning abyss, at which my guide said, So you have complete experience of this ring, go to them. See the state they're in, but keep your words brief. I will talk with him while you're gone, so that he'll lend us his strong shoulders. Thus, yet again, upon the very verge, so alone on the seventh circle's rim, I went to where that sad group was sitting. Misery seemed to well up from their eyes. Now here, now there, futile hands flapped pathetically against the flames, against the scorching ground. As dogs in summer snap or scratch or gnaw, maddened by biting of fleas or gadflies. Although I looked at their faces closely, roasting in the falling fire, I knew none but noticed hanging round the neck of each a pouch of special colour and design, to which their eyes always greedily turned. Looking round me as I moved among them, I saw on a purse of yellow, picked out, the face and shape of an azure lion. Then looking further, I saw another blood-red with a goose more white than butter. Then one who had a pregnant sow in blue, stamped on a white wallet, said sharply to me, "'What are you doing in this pit? Shove off!' And since you're still alive, here's news for you. This seat at my left hand here is reserved for Vitaliano when he gets here. I'm a Paduan amongst Florentines, and they often deafen me by bawling. Come on down, the sovereign cavalier, and bring the purse emblazoned with three goats. Then, twisting his mouth, he stuck out his tongue in the way an ox might to lick its nose. And I, afraid a longer stay might vex my master who had warned me to be brief, I made my way back from those weary souls and found my guide already mounted up on the back of the monstrous animal. He said to me, Take courage, be strong. Our descent has to be down this stairway. You go in front, I'll take the middle, so the tail won't injure you. I, shaking like one who feels a fever coming on, whose nails are pale already and trembles if he glimpses shade, then felt shame stir me to courage like servants with a kind lord. I climbed the shoulders. See, you hold me tight. 
I wanted to say, but found my voice speechless. But he who had helped me through other fears threw both his arms around me as I mounted, and said, Now, Gary on, get on, glide down in gentle arcs, think of your strange burden. As a little ship backs from its moorings, easing away, so the beast departed. When he felt himself hanging in the void, he turned his tail to where his chest had been, then stretching it out, moved it like an eel, gathering the air to him with his paws. To my mind, the terror was no greater in fight on when he relaxed his reins and scorched the sky as the heavens still show, nor when wretched Icarus realised the waxy feathers were melting off him and heard his father cry, Watch your height! than my fear when I saw air on all sides. Then everything faded, but for the beast, swimming slowly, slowly, wheeling downwards, and I feeling the rising wind on my face. Now on my right, I heard the waterfall plunging with a dreadful roar far beneath. I thrust out my head to glance below. My terror grew as we fell. The sight of fires, the sound of agonized wails, so shook me, trembling I huddled up even tighter, and then I saw what I'd missed until now. I gentle spiral down to torment through looming griefs that pressed in ever closer. Then, like a falcon long upon the wing, seeing no lure or prey, descends weary, making the falcon a sigh, Now you fall, circling round and round a hundred times, where before it had been swift, and landing proudly some way away from its master. So Geryon set us down at the bottom, close to the foot of that rock-hewn wall, and free of our weight, suddenly vanished like an arrow set buzzing from the bow. Canto 18 In hell there is a place called Malibolga, made of stone the colour of iron ore, just like the cliff walls that circumscribe it. Right in the middle of that evil space yawns a huge hole, deep and wide. I'll explain in due course its structure. Between the hole and the rock foot of that forbidding cliff, the land descends in ten successive rings as the pattern of moats around a fort protects the ramparts with concentric walls. And as from the entrance of such a fort, so here, running across the banks and ditches, were bridges from the cliff base to the well, gathering them all and cutting them short. Here we found ourselves, shaken off by Geryon's shoulders. The poet turned to the left, and I went after him. At my right hand, I saw fresh agonies with new torments and new torturers filling the first ditch. The sinners in its depths walked naked. Those on our side of its middle faced us. Those beyond it went in our direction, though faster, like the jubilee year when huge crowds gathered and the Romans contrived that people crossing the bridge on one side faced the castle as they made their way towards St. Peter's, and on the other all went in the direction of the mount. On either side, along the gloomy rock, I saw horned devils bearing huge long whips who lashed the souls cruelly from the rear. How they leapt up, squirming at the first crack. No shade paused for a second blow or third. As I passed by, one of them met my glance. Instantly I said, Now him I do know. So I stopped to study him more closely. And my gentle leader paused too, giving me permission to take a few steps back. The lashed shade, thinking to conceal himself, hung his head low, but a little effect. I said, You, head down. Unless you're disguised, you're Venedico Cacianamico. So what brings you to such a sticky end? He replied, I am loath to answer you, but your accent forces me, bringing back memories of the world above. It was I who coaxed my sister Gisolabella to serve the Marquis's lust, however rank the story sounds. Other Bolognese weep here with me, though. The place is crammed full. Not as many tongues have been taught seep, I foresee, between Reno and Savannah. If you want a reliable witness, just remember our avaricious bent. 
But as he spoke, a demon latched at him with his whip and cried, Get away, you pimp! There are no women for you to sell here! When I rejoined my guide, a few paces took us to where a rocky ridge ran out, jutting from the bank. We climbed this with ease, and turning right along its jagged top, left those eternally circling spirits. We reached the place where the ridge is hollowed to form a passage underneath for the scourged. And my guide said, Stop and take in the sight of those other misbegotten spirits whose faces you could not see before now, since they were walking in our direction. So from that ancient bridge we watched the ranks that came towards us on the other side, driven on as the others were by the lash. And without my asking, my good master said, Look at that grand one approaching us now, who does not seem to shed a tear of pain. How regally he still carries himself. That is Jason, who with courage and wit took the golden fleece from the Colchians. He journeyed to the island Lemnos, too, where the pitiless women had slaughtered all the men. There, with words and looks of love, he seduced the young maid, Hypsipyle, who had herself gulled the other women, and there he left her, pregnant and alone. Such guilt condemns him to this punishment, and Medea exacts her vengeance too. That type of deceiver all go with him, let that be sufficient of the first ditch, and the sinners imprisoned in its jaws. Now we had come to the narrow pathway, that intersects the second bank and forms the shoulder of another rising arch. Here we heard the souls deep in the next pit whimpering, making grunts and snorting sounds, and beating at themselves with open palms. A foul vapour crusted the banks with mould that, floating up, clogged their eyes and noses. The bottom was so deep we had no view except by climbing the arch and peering down from the full height of the rocky bridge. We reached the spot, and from there I saw people down in the ditch, plunged in excrement that might have flowed directly from the world. And while I searched below with probing eyes, I saw one soul's head so fouled in crap, you couldn't say if he were Clark or Lay. He shouted, Why I me more greedily than the other scum? I said to him, If I remember, I once saw your hair clean, Alessio Intimene of Lucca. That's why I watch you more than the others. Beating on his pate, he said then to me, Flattery with which my tongue wagged tireless has submerged me here below. Look further, advised my guide, on that woman's face, at that rumpled and filthy harridan now scratching herself with fouled nails and crouching now, now standing on her feet, that is Thais, the whore who replied to her lover's question when he asked her, Are you most grateful? Oh, incredibly. I think by now we have seen enough here. Canto 19 Oh, Simon Magus, or oh, sad disciples, rapacious creatures, prostitutes for cash, for gold and silver things that are of God, that men of virtue should hold forever. Now the trumpet shall sound its blast for you. You finish up here, down in the third pit. We had already climbed the next grave, up the rocky ridge which hangs directly just above the middle of the ditch. Oh, supreme wisdom, what great artistry you display in heaven, on earth and hell, and how justly you dispense your power. Along the sides and bottom I could see the livid rock was bored, riddled by holes all round and similar in size and width. To me they seemed no larger or deeper than those inside my San Giovanni, designed as basins for baptismal rites, one of which, not so many years ago, I broke to save someone drowning in it. That's the truth, so let the matter rest. Out of the mouth of each hole there emerged a sinner's feet, and his legs up to the calf. The rest of the body was stuffed inside. The soles of their feet were licked by flames, making their limbs twitch in spasm so strong they would have snapped any rope that bound them. And just as oily flames will only glide across the surface, here the fire slid from heel to toe across the foot. Master, I said, 
Who is that writhing spirit there who twitches more than the others and burns with flames fiercer red? And so he said, I'll carry you, if you like, to the bank lower down. You can hear his story there. Whatever pleases you will please me too, I replied. Your word commands me. You know my secret thoughts unspoken. We made our way to the fourth bank, turned and made our way down, keeping to the left within that narrow deep, riddled with all its holes. My kindly guide did not put down his load until the whole of the one who showed his pain with his legs. Whoever you may be, you wretched soul, stuck upside down and planted like a stake, speak to me if you still have that power. There I stood, just like some friar confessing a vile assassin, whose time has been fixed, but who calls him back to put off dying. Is that you, Boniface, standing there? The chronicles have lied to me by several years. Are you already jaded with the wealth for which you deceived and mangled a church the fairest of women? I stood and stared, unable to respond, like someone mocked. Virgil addressed me then. Go on, tell him. Say, I'm not the one you think I am. So I said it, just as he asked me to. At which the spirit's feet twitched in frenzy. Heaving a sigh, he answered me, his voice heavy with tears. What is it that you want? If you're so eager you came down the bank, know that once I dressed in the great mantle, but was in truth one of the she-bear's sons, and was so keen to advance the bear cubs I pocketed wealth. And down here, myself. Under my head, flat in the fissures, cower other souls who came before me, sinning in simony. I shall join them when he comes, the one who I thought you were when I was so quick to ask my question. But my feet have burned longer, and I've been upside down longer than he shall stay here with his feet on fire. For from the west shall come a lawless shepherd, whose deeds are foul enough to cover him and me. Perhaps I was too bold when I spoke here. For I said, replying to him, Tell me, what gold did our Lord seek from St. Peter before he placed the keys in his hands? None. He said only, Follow me. Did Peter or the others demand gold or silver from Matthias in the ballot for the place that the wicked Judas lost? Stay stuck there where your torment is deserved. Watch over your stolen gold carefully that made you so courageous against Charles. And were it not for my reverence, for those great keys you held once still living, I would make use of even harsher words because your avarice saddens all the world, trampling the good, promoting the wicked. You have made your god of gold and silver. How are you different from the heathen, then, save that they pray to one, you to a hundred? Ah, Constantine, what wickedness was born, not from your conversion, but from the gift received by the first pope that made him rich? While I was chanting such a song to him, from wrath or the gnawing tooth of conscience, he lunged violently with both his feet, I do believe my guide was well pleased, for he listened satisfied to the sound of the truth I spoke, and then gathered me in his arms, close to his chest, and climbed up the same path he had clambered down before. Nor did he grow tired of carrying me, until the summit of the arch that spans the fourth bank and the fifth. With gentle care he set down his load, on the steep, rough ridge, a path that would be difficult for goats. From there another valley was revealed. Canto 20 New punishments are my theme and matter for the twentieth canto of part one that deals with those sunk deep beneath the earth. Now I was ready and prepared to peer into the depths of sinners' anguished tears and I saw there in the valley's circle souls walking at the speed that penitents in our world proceed, silent and weeping. As my scrutiny continued, I saw an amazing deformation between their chins and where the chest begins. Faces back to front looked down towards the haunches. To move ahead, they walked but in reverse, denied the means of looking to the front. It may be that, through some paralysis, someone at some time was twisted like this, but I have yet to see, and I doubt it. So God may grant you, reader, benefit from my poem. Consider for yourself how I could stop from crying, 
when nearby I saw a human shape so distorted that tears falling from the eyes poured down to splash the buttocks cleft. Indeed I wept, leaning on a rock jutting from the ridge. Still like all the other fools? My guide spoke. What can be worse than the man who adds his own suffering to God's just decree? Lift, lift up your head and look at him there for whom the earth gaped wide while Theban eyes looked on and cried out, Amphiarius, why are you rushing? Why desert the fray? Nor did his headlong fall cease before Minos, who gets his clutches into every soul. See how he makes a chest from his shoulders, because he wished to see too far ahead. Now he looks behind and goes in reverse. See there Tiresias, who changed from man to woman, transformed in every limb. So before his plumage was male again, he had to strike his wand another time against a pair of intertwining snakes. She whose unbound tresses conceal her breasts and her hairs in front, but now behind her, was Manto, who wandered through many lands, then settled in the place where I was born. Let me tell you a little of her tale. After her father left the living and Bacchus's city fell to slavery, she spent long years roaming throughout the world. Now up in fair Italy lies a lake below the Alpine link with Germany above Tyrol. Benarcus is its name. No doubt a thousand streams or more cascade from Apennine and Val Camonica to Garda, in whose lake their waters rest. In the centre is a place where all three bishops, Tridentine, Bresci, and Veronese, could grant a blessing should they take that road. What will not stay in Benarcus's bosom cascades down to form a river that flows through green meadows. It gathers speed and weight, not the Benarcus now, but the Mincio until it joins the Po at Goberno. But just before it runs its course, it spreads over lowlands, turning into a swamp, in summertime the source of rank odour. There, passing by, the savage virgin saw lying in the middle of the marsh land uncultivated and untenanted. Here, to practice her arts, and to avoid all human intercourse, she with her slaves came to settle and finally died there. In time, the scattered people of those parts drew to that spot, protected by the marsh, they built a city over those dead bones, and called it Mantua, because of her, not because any auguries were cast. I tell you this, so if you ever hear my city had another origin, you will not let those lies pollute the truth. Master, I'm convinced by what you say, anything else would seem like burnt-out coals, I said. Tell me, these people passing by, are any of them worthy of remark? Because my mind is tuned to that. To which he answered, that one over there, whose beard is spread over his swarthy shoulders, was a soothsayer. When so few men were left in Greece, even the cradles were bare. His name, Eurypolis. He can be found somewhere within my tragedy, as you who knows it through and through knows well. And he, the skin and bone, was Michael Scott, the master of magical deception. See those dreadful women who laid aside needles, shuttles and spindle for witchcraft binding their spells with herbs and effigies. But let's move. Already Cain, with his thorns, touches the sea beyond Seville, one half in each hemisphere. You must remember the moon was full last night, and there were times when she did you no harm in that deep wood. This is what he said. Meanwhile, we walked on. Canto 21 From one bridge to the next we continued, discussing subjects that my comedy cares not to sing of. We gained the summit and paused to view another cavity of Malibolgi, the next ravine of tears, and saw it was mysteriously dark. As in the Venice arsenal, they boil sticky pitch in winter, to cork the leaks in unsafe ships which can't set sail. And some rebuild their craft from scratch, while others make repairs on hulls well voyaged. So here, not by fire, but artifice, there boil below a thick and pitchy mass forming a viscous coat on either bank. I stared at it, but could see nothing there except bubbles rising from the boiling, and it all heave and settle down again. While I was gazing intently below, 
My guide exclaimed and hauled me from the edge at which I turned, like one who looks to see when he should run, struck by sudden terror, but looking back does not delay his flight, and saw a jet-black devil come behind, running at speed along the stony ridge. What a terrifying mask his face was! How cruel he seemed with every movement made! And so nimble on his feet with spread wings, bearing on his sharply pointed shoulder, he had slung a sinner by both his thighs, clutching him by the sinews of the heel. Malebranche! he shouted from our bridge. I have an elder of Santa Zita. You shove him under, I'll go back for more. His city is well stocked with ones like him. Everyone there's a cheat, except Monturo. In Luca, no becomes a yes for cash. He threw him down and turned along the rock. No dog was ever slipped to chase a thief quite so fast. The sinner sank, then surfaced. But the demons from beneath the bridge cried, No place here for the sacred face. No swimming here like in the Saccio. If you want to avoid our grappling hooks, stay down below the level of the pitch. Then they stabbed at him with a hundred prongs, shouting, Here you caper under cover, so try your swindling beneath the surface, like cooks who have scallions to poke meat with hooks so it does not float in the pot. My master said, Don't let them see you crouch behind a rock to get some cover, and don't be afraid, whatever they say. I had to face something like it before. He passed the bridgehead and reached the sixth bank. I needed then to look as bold as brass. For with a fury like nothing else than the frenzied rush of dogs at some poor man who stops to beg, they stormed from where they hid and set upon him with their grappling irons. Stop the lot of you! He shouted. Just one. Come forward to listen to me, then see if you want to poke me with your grapples. Malacody, you go! They all shout out, and while the rest remained, one stepped forward, muttering, Now what good will this do him? My master said, Now then, Malacoda, do you think I'd get here this far and still safe, despite your obstacles and defences, without divine approval and fate's accord? Let me pass now. It is willed in heaven. I must show another this savage path. His pride was so pricked that the demon dropped his prong, but said to the others, Let him go unharmed. My leader called to me, you, hiding there, crouched among the boulders of the bridge, it's safe to come. So I came, and with speed the devils now edged forward, all of them, so I feared they might not keep their word. They aimed their prods at us, and one muttered, Shall I jab him in the ass? Good and hard! They shouted as one. But Malakoda, talking with my leader, whipped round to scream, Leave it, Scamiglione, leave it out! Then announced to us, you cannot go on much further by this rock ridge. The sixth arch lies all smashed to bits in the pit below, but if you want to continue, go down this ridge a while. There's an archway there. Five hours from this time yesterday, 1,266 years have passed since the road wrecked here. I'm sending some of my troop down there to see that no one is coming up for air. Go with them, they'll do you no damage. Over here, Alicino. Calcabrina! Cagnazzo! You, Barbariccia, you're in charge. Libicotco! Draginazzo, you too. Tutti Ciriato, Grafiacani, and Fafarello, the mad Rubicanti, go and scout all around the boiling mess. Make sure they're safe to the other bridge that passes complete over the ditches. Master, I'm not sure about this at all. I said, let's go alone, no escort. Do we really need them? You know the way, if you are as keen as you usually are. Have you not noticed them gnashing away and threatening us with their beetle eyebrows? But he said, There is no reason to fear. Let them gnash away just as they want to. It's for the seething sinners, not for us. They turned off to the left along the ridge, but not till each of them had nipped his tongue between his teeth to salute their leader, and he had farted like a trumpet to them. <laughs>